So Paul is writing to uh, a man named Titus, and he says to him in verse 5, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So here's the reason Titus was there. I got a job to do, Titus. You got to appoint leaders in the churches. And then beginning at verse number six, he starts laying out the character qualities of what an elder in the church should be. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So when we read the Bible, we see that God established three institutions. In Genesis, we see that he established the family in chapter 1. Then in chapter 12, uh, you can go ahead and advance the slide. In chapter 12, he uh, it called a man named Abraham, and he said to Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And so there was Israel, so the family, Israel. And now in the New Testament, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so we know that everything that God created and loves, the devil hates and tries to destroy. The devil is attacking the family like never before. The devil hates Israel, and the devil hates the church. He hates Lifebridge Church. He would like nothing better than to stamp this light out. He hates the Baptist General Conference. He hates all Bible-believing, gospel-preaching churches all around the world. Everything that God is for, the devil is pushing back against. Now, when we think about Christians, we have broad agreement on many doctrinal issues. We, we, you know, we essentially agree on the, the Trinity, that God's the Father, that Jesus is God, that the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. Most Christians would hold to the inerrancy of the Bible and that salvation from sin is in Jesus alone and that a Christian should have a holy life. So those kind of doctrinal things, there's a lot of agreement. But when it comes to church, there's a wide range of opinions about how church should be. Christians have many different vision, views, uh, views of the church, how the church is governed, what's the purpose of the church, how should the church worship, how will the church age end, you know, what will be the coming of Christ, how will that all happen. Uh, we're having communion tonight. There's so much different diversity about how communion should be. And, of course, baptism, the different views of baptism. And when it comes to church government, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the head of the church. And Colossians chapter 1 says that Jesus must be first or preeminent in all things. Always Jesus is the head, and he's the one that receives the glory in the church. But then as Baptists, we look at the Bible and we read that the church government was done by the congregation. The congregation had a say in all the things that were happening in the early church. And we take that model to be the way that we should op operate as well. So, for instance, in Acts chapter 6, we see that the church uh, elected the deacons. You remember that in Acts chapter 6, there was a controversy. Some of the wi women in the church in Jerusalem that were from the Greek background were not getting the same care as the Jewish women were. And so the complaint came to the apostles, and the apostles said to the people, look, our role is to preach the word of God, to pray, and to minister. You need to appoint, you need to appoint seven men, and they will handle this business of making sure that the distribution is looked after properly. And so they did that. They picked seven men, and it was the church that was involved in the choosing of its officers. In Acts 15, we read about the church being involved in doctrinal decisions. When Paul and Barnabas went on their first missionary journey, they went to the Gentiles, 
and they preached the gospel and many were saved and baptized and churches were planted. But they didn't call the new believers, the men, to be circumcised. And so the church in Jerusalem said, hey, we, what about this? You know, the covenant sign of the Old Testament is that circumcision. And so in Acts 15, they had a huge church council. And in fact, uh, it, they, the church, it says in verse 12, the church kept silent and listened to Barnabas and, and Paul. And they, they, uh, it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men to Antioch. The church made the decision, said, you're right. The Gentiles, they don't have to follow the Old Testament law any longer. They can just be saved by grace through faith. The church we see is involved in the correction of its members. In Matthew 18, Jesus said, you know, if somebody has a controversy, a conflict, they should go one to one. And if that can't get resolved, then they should bring two other people to listen uh, to the discussion. And if that still doesn't get it resolved, then the issue should come to the whole church. And if that still doesn't get it resolved, the person that is refusing to repent and humble himself, the person that's refusing to, to obey, should be put out of the church and treated in a different way, treated like a, a public and a, a tax collector. And of course, how do we treat them? Well, the, we love them and we pray for them and we want them to be saved and to come back. We don't cast them out and kick them in, in the back and say, get out of here, we never want to see you again. No, it's... It's very much to pray and, and seek reconciliation. But you see how the church was involved when the members needed correction. And then, of course, we know uh, from Acts 13 and 14 that Paul and Barnabas were sent out by the church in Antioch, and they went and did their ministry, their, their, their mission ministry. And then uh, when uh, they, it says at the end of chapter 14, finally they returned by ship to Antioch where their journey had begun. The believers there had entrusted them to the grace of God to do the work they had now completed. Upon arriving in Antioch, they called the church together and reported everything God had done through them and how he'd opened the door of faith to the Gentiles too. So the church sent the missionaries out. They did their missionary journey and they came back and they reported to the whole church all that was going on. So when, when Baptists look at these things, we say, well, you know, this is a sign of congregational government. When we think about the leaders in the local church, we find the New Testament uses three Greek words interchangeably. And some of them we read tonight in our passage from Titus. There's the bishop, and that's the Greek word episkopos, which means overseer. So in some, some denominations, you have the bishop or the archbishop. Well, this is where it comes from, the Greek word episkopos. And it literally means to oversee. The second word that is used is also the word that we read tonight in our text from Titus, elder. And that doesn't mean an old person. It means uh, that's the Greek word presbyteros, which is kind of like the president of the assembly in ancient Greek times. So a leader. So the bishop is overseeing. The elder is uh, presiding or the president over the assembly. And then the pastor, the more common word that we use in the Baptist church, is the Greek word poimen, and that means shepherd. And so your pastor shepherds you. He protects you. He calls you back from the edge of the cliff and says, hey, watch your life. Watch what's going on. He protects the sheep from the wolf that's trying to come in. That's the role of the shepherd. And so these three Greek words are often used interchangeably to talk about the same person. So let me, let me show you a couple of examples of this. Here's one from Acts chapter 20. And then we'll look at the one that we were just looking at in Titus. In Acts chapter 20, verse 17, the Apostle Paul comes to an island off the coast of Ephesus. He stops in the island of Miletus, and he called for the elders of the church. He calls for the presbyteros. And look what he says to them in his address to them in verse 28. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock... So that's the, you know, that's a shepherding part, right? So he's talking to elders, he's calling them to be shepherds, and then he uses the Greek word episkopos, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, episkopoi, in the, in the plural. Uh, and he, so this, this word overseer is the same word that comes here from the word episkopos. And it means that you are now overseeing. So he's talking to the elders, 
He's saying that you have the role of the overseer. And then he says, oh, poimen, to shepherd the church of God. To poimen the church of God. So you see how all three of these words are used interchangeably to talk about, he's, he's talking to the same group of people. He's not saying, here's the elders, here's the uh, uh, bishops, and here's the pastors. He's talking to them all together. He called for the elders to come to visit him on the island, and he's giving them, and he's saying, you are overseers, you are shepherds, you are uh, uh, presbyteros, you're presiding, and you have this role. Now, in our text that we just read a moment ago, uh, Paul says to Titus, I want you to appoint elders in every city. And then he goes on, he says, and they are overseers as well. So they're, they're, it, they're elders and overseers, but it's the same, the same person or the same uh, type of person. Okay, so let's come back to our text now in Titus chapter 1. And the first thing that we need to talk about it when we're, and, and, and your pastor asked me to teach on this, what, are, what, are the, what does the Bible say are the biblical requirements for a person's life to be, considered, to be considered for an elder? And so we often talk about character, competence, and chemistry. So for a good team to be uh, functioning well, you need people of good character, have competence in their skill set, and then chemistry, can they all work together? Can they re be relational? Can they, can they do things well together as a team? And so the list in this passage here in Titus chapter 1 means that God has special qualifications for leaders in the church. Leaders should not be chosen at random or just because they volunteer or because they aspire or desire the position or even because they are natural leaders. Leaders should be chosen because they match the qualifications listed here in Titus 1. It's fine if a man thinks he is called, yet he must also be qualified. You know, in my role as national leader, sometimes I get pulled into some real deep meetings when there's problems in the church. And I talked earlier about how we want to have healthy churches. And, you know, when the pastor and the board are not uh, there's not a healthy relationship between the two. The pastor is one of the elders, as we looked at in our text here. But there's other elders who are in the church, and there needs to be that good chemistry, that good working together. And oftentimes I get called in when it's, uh, you know, the, my, the joke is about my role. It's you're either cutting the ribbon, you're celebrating something, or you're putting out the fire, right? Those are the two reasons you show up. Uh, is that you're celebrating or you're, uh, you're the fireman. And so oftentimes when they come to these kind of meetings, I'm the fireman that's there to try to put out the fire before the whole church gets engulfed by the issues that are happening at the board level. If the church had been more patient, more cautious, more discerning in who they put into these elder roles, some of the issues that I've dealt with would not ever have happened. But when somebody is put into a role, they're too young, they're too new in their faith, they're, they're kind of got some pride about being an elder, they've got all these things that are going on. When that happens, then very quickly uh, the chemistry of the elder team can be uh, moved in the wrong direction. So the qualification for leadership in Titus 1 has nothing to do with their gifting. Every one of us has a spiritual gift, but that's not what Paul is referring to here. We're going to look at them in a moment. He didn't say to Titus, find the most gifted guys. Character. Developing character takes time and a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Going to seminary doesn't make one qualified for spiritual leadership. I'm a seminary president. I want everybody to consider going to seminary. But just because you go to seminary doesn't mean that you are a good spiritual leader. And being a good speaker or successful in business doesn't make you qualified either. What qualifies a man for spiritual leadership is godly character. And godly a character is what Paul is describing here in his list of things. Now, let me say one other thing before we begin the list. This is not a rigid list which demands perfection in all areas. It's like goals to work towards and general criteria for selection. We should take this list and ask... Does the man that we're thinking about making an elder, 
Does the man desire all these things on his list with his whole heart? Does that desire show itself in his life? Paul gave this list to Titus so that he would take the list around the island of Crete and find men who best fit the description and then use the list as a training guide to disciple these men. And let me say also that these qualifications are valuable for every Christian, male, female, leader, non-leader. They're it's not just for those who aspire to leadership. These are clear indicators of godly character and spiritual maturity, and they can give a true measure of a person. So let's look at what Paul writes here in our, uh, in our text. Titus chapter 1. An elder must be, first of all, the reputation. They must be blameless. That word blameless comes from the Greek, which means nothing to take hold upon. So in the eyes of the church community and in the eyes of the larger community, does this person that you're considering for an elder have a blameless reputation? Not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But blameless. Is there nothing that can be taken hold on in their life and said, you know, this, this person should not be a spiritual leader. They've got a gambling problem. Or they're, you know, they, they, they've got some other character flaw. Uh, their reputation is blameless. Then the second thing about their family. Mm -hmm. In, in Paul's time, many people had one or more wives. And so Paul is advocating here, I think he's advocating for uh, not multiple wives, not a polygamist, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. So what is their family life like? Uh, do, they, do they have a good marriage? Is there, is, is, do they love their, their wife? Are they, are they faithful to her? Are they, uh, they have a, a, a good marriage? And then how, is there, how are their children? Uh, a, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. So the family life of the elder has to be looked at as well. And sometimes our children are, uh, as they grow older and they grow up, they leave home, they choose a different path. But as long as they were in the home, how were they raised? What was the example that was given to them? What was the way that their lives were molded in their formative years? The third thing Paul talks about is their lifestyle. The elder that you're considering should not be overbearing. You know, not uh, harsh on people. Not quick-tempered, you know, they've got their anger and their temper in check. Not given to drunkenness, they're not living a, 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 a drunken lifestyle. They're not violent, and they're not pursuing dishonest gain. Wow, their lifestyle. You see, what Paul is calling here is, wow, this is something that you have to take the measure of the person. And you look at these things that are written here in Titus, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we're not looking for perfection, but is the person aspiring to these things? Another thing Paul mentions here is they've got to be loving. Rather, they must be, he must be hospitable. One who loves what is good. One who is self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. You see these... Uh, Character qualities here are all very important for when you're choosing an elder. It's not talking about necessarily someone who's a good speaker or good in business or uh, popular. It's what's their character like and one who loves what is good. That's, the, to me, the thing that stands out the most in this list. Do they love what is good in this, in, in, uh, in, with the gospel? Do they love the Lord? Do they love the Bible? Do they love the things that are good and upright? Are they holy and disciplined in all that they are doing? And then the last thing he mentions here is they must be mature in Christ. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message, you know, the gospel, as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So the elder has to be someone who can uh, uh, explain and articulate the gospel and then can refute in some way uh, those who oppose the message. So Paul is lay laying out this list of things here. Now remember, he's talking to Titus, and Paul had been on Crete and had started a, a, a ministry there, 
And so these are all fairly new Christians. These are not, uh, this is not a, a, an old church, like the Iranian church. They're all fairly new Christians. It's hard to find leaders in the Iranian house church because of these things that they still have to develop. And Paul is saying to Titus, hey, these are the people that you should be looking for to put into places of leadership in the local church on Crete. And I would say, these are the things that LifeBridge should be looking for in those that you want to lay hands on and bring into the eldership of your church. Choosing elders is vital for the health and vitality of the local church. If things go wrong at the board level, at the elder level, the church almost certainly will not be a healthy church. The, the elders need to be people of mature character. They need to be people who can hold things in confidence. They're going to hear things about people's lives in the church. They're going to be brought into the muck and the mess that goes on in the world around us and it happens inside the church. They're going to have to be people that can handle that and, and, and not be uh, fearful and, and not be immature about how they deal with the issues. They're going to have to be people of faith, people who can really make good decisions. And, you know, uh, a lot of church boards are uh, very good people, but they're just not willing to take a chance, take a risk. Don't want to do anything. Don't want to step up by faith. We've got, we've got to make sure all the money's there before we do anything. You know, that's not how God works. God, God calls us to step out on faith sometimes. And the elder board has to do that. And so these are the people that you need to be praying for that God will raise up at LifeBridge. I know you've got some great leaders here already. And your pastor asked me to speak on this passage to, uh, to as you were thinking about future leaders and thinking about future uh, people to fill this role, to take this passage and make it not a popularity contest, not a, not a, uh, you know, a, uh, you're my friend, so I'm going to vote for you, but to really choose wa wisely. And if you use the qualifications that Paul wrote to Titus to guide your decisions, life rich will be blessed. Because when the leadership is together praying and walking together in unity, and there's good godly character, there's competence, and then there's chemistry going together, the church will thrive. And the church will move forward with such uh, unity and such beauty. Uh, and it all starts when the local church makes right decisions at this point, at this moment. This is when uh, the future of the church is set by the people that are chosen to sit around that table. Let me pray with you.